good, good morning, everyone. It's, it's very good to be here and it's wonderful to be with you, whether you're here in the sanctuary or attending by Zoom. Um, as was the case last week, there'll be a few COVID related features of the service. Uh, first, uh, we still ask that people in the sanctuary wear masks. Uh, a number of experts continue to think this is a sensible precaution, even though many of us, maybe all of us are vaccinated. Uh, similarly, we won't be doing any congregational singing although we will have some wonderful music during the service. Again, our philosophy is to err if we do on the side of caution, hence the masks, um, protecting one another remains the most important thing we can do. Finally, we'll have communion like we did last month using those cute little pre-sale communion kits that are more or less impossible to open without spilling. Um, those get rid of part of the ritual. Uh, those taking part by Zoom, you can either have with you a small amount of bread and drink to use during communion, or if that's not feasible, please take part in communion in spirit alone. I uh, wish everyone a, a wonderful Independence Day. We'll be talking a lot about more about that uh, later in the service. And now let's turn our minds to prayer and reflection, and let me ask Lee, our liturgist, to begin our worship. This morning, the call to worship is based on Psalm 91. We who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to our Creator, my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. For God will deliver us from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. God will cover us with an eagle's pinions, and under God's wings we will find refuge. God's faithfulness is a shield and buckler. We will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. For God is our shelter. God's loving kindness is forever. Now I'll read the invocation. O oh God, on this Independence Day 2021, we pray that you will protect and guide our country, lead all in our nation to cherish the ideals of democracy, the protection of liberties and equality before the law. Give us wisdom to make these ideals a reality so that we be can become a beacon to the world in achieving justice and well being within a diverse and creative nation. Amen.
The scripture reading this morning reminds us of the fact that we are obligated to go out and spread and do the work of God, bringing to all that we know the message of God given to us by Jesus, our Savior. It's Mark Chapter 6, verses 7 through 13. Jesus called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Amen. And thank you, uh, Katie and Debbie, for that wonderful music this morning. That was really beautiful. Uh, the 4th of July, the nation's birthday, always raises strong feelings for me. I grew up with immigrant grandparents, and like many children of immigrant families, I was brought up to be patriotic. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, equal protection of the laws, and the right to vote had very concrete meanings to the elders in my family. There was nothing abstract or theoretical about them. We valued these rights greatly, and the US Constitution, which established these rights, were deeply, was deeply respected. So too was the American flag, which we understood as a symbol of the values incorporated in the Constitution and in the Bill of Rights. The 4th of July for us was an important holiday with religious as well as secular overtones. The rather traditional flag-based patriotism taught in our family didn't mean that my grandparents and parents believed that in practice, American democracy was working as it should. Far from it. We were extremely conscious of racism and all in the family despised it. When my maternal grandmother, a refugee from anti-Jewish racism under the czar, came to the United States in 1910, she first went to settle in Atlanta, but she soon left for New York appalled at the treatment of black people in the South. My grandparents and parents at various times in their lives personally experienced anti-Jewish discrimination, which was common in the United States through the 1950s. And living in central New Jersey, 
we witnessed racial segregation and severe poverty in places like Newark and Elizabeth. My parents viewed racism as a personal affront and they vocally supported the civil rights movement, including campaigning for fair housing laws in our own community. No one in our family would have entertained the illusion that American democracy was even close to perfect. To the contrary, all recognized that there was deep injustice built into American institutions, which needed to be redressed before the country could truly be called democratic. Yet despite my parents' recognition of the severe shortcomings of American democracy, patriotism remained the rule in our family. No hostile language disparaging the United States or disrespect for its symbols like the flag would have been permitted in our house. My parents were very much aware of the examples of Hitler's Germany and Stalin's Russia, both murderous regimes that disdain democratic protections like free speech and due process of law. Despite its many failings, the United States maintained democracy, civil liberties, and equality under the law as its national principles, its national aspirations, and this tradition was to be cherished. And in the 1960s, there were hopeful signs that the United States might soon come closer to bringing the country's actual practices and institutions better into line with the country's ideals. The civil rights movement was gaining momentum, especially with the emergence of Dr. King. The credibility of the United States as a true champion of democracy was growing. The American flag was an increasingly believable and persuasive symbol of civil liberties and of equality under the law. Much of the imagery of the civil rights movement was quite patriotic and centered on the flag. Despite everything in our history, the movement displayed faith in the American future. As Dr. King famously said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. People like my parents drew optimism and strength from the example of the civil rights movement, and they brought me up to do so as well. A great deal has happened since the mid 1960s. Although the civil rights movement resulted in tangible progress against injustice, the goal of true equality is still far from being realized. We continue to see so much racism expressed sometimes in murderous ways. The persistence of this racism causes us pain, fatigue, and discouragement. In view of today's persistent and tragic racism, it can be difficult to maintain Dr. King's faith in the triumph of American democracy. And there are other indications of danger to the principles of democracy and civil liberties, both around the world and here in the United States. Outside the United States, authoritarian government has sadly made a comeback. Superpowers like China and Russia, along with smaller countries like Hungary and Nicaragua, openly disdain democracy and implement authoritarian practices with blatant suppression of dissent. And here in the United States over the past five years, for the first time in my memory, many people, included elected including elected representatives and public officials, are deeply resentful at what they perceive as political neglect by urban elites. These people angrily refuse to acknowledge the validity of the 2020 election. They resist participating in public health measures designed to protect the country's population as a whole and they angrily dismiss much advocacy for racial justice as offensive political correctness. The people espousing these views seem willing to accept a move away from democracy and in the direction of authoritarianism as a means of responding to the disrespect to which they believe they have been subjected. I believe the emergence of a group with apparently authoritarian views and already with a history of public violence poses a serious problem for this country, probably the most serious problem since the battle over Jim Crow in the 1950s and 1960s. The question for our consideration this Independence Day 2021 is how we as concerned people of faith with an abhorrence of racism and a commitment to democracy should respond to today's challenges. How can we most constructively oppose racism and help preserve democracy in the current national setting? Our reading today from Mark shows one possible way of dealing with others who seem to reject our core values. In our reading, Jesus commissions the 12 apostles to go through the towns and villages, spreading the message of Jesus. If the apostles are not welcome in a particular village, they are to shake the dust from their feet as they leave, 
apparently in disdain for those who have rejected them. Now, I can understand Jesus' advice to the apostles as a warning that not everyone will accept the message of Jesus, that the realm of God will not be built overnight. These are important things for all followers of Jesus to remember. But as a means of achieving reconciliation with those who seem to be espousing authoritarianism and racism in the United States today, dismissively wiping the dust from our feet does not seem to be a promising model. Expressing disdain for, or even impatience with, fellow Americans will simply reinforce the sense of grievance that has brought about the current situation. We can't dismiss fellow Americans from our lives. We share the same country with them. We have no choice but to find a way to calm political passions and encourage a consensus in favor of democracy, including the rejection of racism. We need to resurrect traditions of civil dialogue in the United States. I believe that the peace and well being of this country depend upon it. The need for reconciliation, for resumed dialogue, does not mean that we should compromise on questions vital to the preservation of democracy. Elections must be respected, otherwise, there is no democracy. The voting rights of everyone, including members of all minority groups, must be preserved. Racism, including racially motivated violence, must be rejected unequivocally, and racially motivated assaults and similar violence must be prosecuted. On these and similar questions, there is no room for compromise without abandoning democracy. But this doesn't mean that democracy and racial justice can't be defended with civility and even love toward those whose views we deeply oppose. Jesus was at his wisest and most holy when he said we should love all our fellow human beings, including those we might be tempted to see as our enemies. We should remember well the advocacy of the civil rights movement and particularly of Dr. King, which was built on the Gandhian principle of nonviolence. This advocacy did not compromise, but it also did not write off any human being. The advocacy of Dr. King was always defined by love, the kind of love that Jesus preached. Part of the solution in which the Biden administration already is engaged may be to repair some of the economic institutions that have frustrated many in this country and that have helped fuel some of the anti-democratic sentiment. I think that redressing valid economic grievances in the rural and exurban parts of this country can be helpful in reducing anti-democratic sentiment, some of which I think has been born of economic frustration. But much more will need to be done. I think we do need to engage in advocacy, not dismissive or hostile advocacy, but persistent and faithful advocacy in the tradition of Dr. King and the civil rights movement. And in this advocacy, we should remind ourselves and everyone else of the ideology that has always been honored in this country, even if it has not always been fulfilled in practice. An ideology built upon elections, equality, and fairness for all. And in reminding ourselves and others of this core American ideology, we should not hesitate to rely on the symbols of the Constitution and the flag. All Americans who were in this country as children grew up pledging allegiance to the flag as a symbol of a democratic nation, a republic, individual and with liberty and justice, indivisible and with liberty and justice for all. Through vigorous advocacy in support of democracy and racial justice, we pray that all Americans will be reminded of this familiar pledge of allegiance and that the flag may become for all a symbol of our personal promise to help make democracy and liberty and justice a reality for all Americans. May the elevation of the symbols of constitution and flag remind all Americans of the American dream of freedom and justice, of the centrality of democracy and equality to that dream, and of the faith that we can all be better citizens of this country tomorrow than we are today. Happy 4th of July, everyone. May this holiday be a day of renewed hope for a brighter and happier future for our beloved country a future rid of racism and enduringly safe for democracy. Amen.
Today, we have the opportunity to give offerings that make this a better world. Let us do this joyfully. Accept, O oh God, these offerings which your people give today and grant your blessing for the uses to which these funds will be spent to promote peace and goodwill throughout the world. Amen. Now it's time for us to share our joys and concerns, to uh, offer prayers for the, those things that concern us or that we'd like to share out of joy. Um, would anyone like to start? Jay. I like it here. I'm, I'm improving. I got a lot of problems that I got to work out in my own mind, as I believe a lot of other Americans do. When I left town in 1968, Montgomery County was white. It was probably 99% white. It's changed. And I hope I've changed. And I hope what I see, my kids doing it, has changed. I'm afraid the internet is warping some of our kids' minds. Like my granddaughter, who is unhappy to be an American, and he said, I'm proud of you. Well, th thank you, Jay. Uh, we pray for our country, for it to achieve its dreams, and for the flag and the 
other symbols of this country, like the Constitution, to be uh, symbols of uh, everything that is forward looking and uh, humane in the world. Thank you very much, Jay. Any, any others? Yes. There's all of us who are Dini Swanson, who continues to take infusions bi weekly for his esophageal cancer. He will be taking his next treatment next Wednesday. Yeah. And, and Dean's voice, I'm pleased to say, continues to improve, which is a, a blessing. So thank, thank you very much, Lake. Prayers, of course, for, for Dean. Uh, yes. Um, I'd like to ask for prayers for the people in Japan who um, there was a horrific mudslide, and um, a, a number of people were have already been killed and lost their homes, and it's just a, a, a terrible situation over there. Uh, I'd also like to ask for continued prayers for the people in Surfside. Um, another tragedy that, that's happened. And um, I'd also like to ask for prayers for um, a young woman named Jamel. She is the niece of um, a lifelong friend of mine, and she was just recently diagnosed with cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly um, uh, join in prayers for the victims of the mudslides in Japan and, and the building collapse in Florida. Uh, what a ter terrible things those are. Uh, and um, we, uh, uh, we, we, we pray for uh, healing and, and comfort for uh, Janelle. Yes. Uh, Thien wants to uh, let folks know that she was discharged from the hospital on Thursday and is feeling a bit better every day. She thanks us for our prayers and notes. She says the treatment wiped out my good antibodies as well as bad. So I'm isolating until my immune system rebounds. Oh, well, prayer of thanks for uh, Thien's recovery. And uh, uh, it's, it's great to hear that she's doing uh, better every day. And I'm sure that the immune system issue will be sorted out uh, as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Yes. Anybody else? Well, uh, if, if not, um, let's uh, pray for all the needs of our community. Uh, for those concerns that have been raised this morning and those that have been left unsaid. Uh, I, I would actually like to uh, add a prayer for, uh, 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 for Stan and for um, Gail and Stan's children, uh, Todd Scott and Karen, and, and for all their grandchildren who are right now uh, still grieving, of course, the passing of, of Gail. And I would like then to uh, pray uh, on this Independence Day fervently for the flourishing of democracy and justice here in America and around the world. May the United States be an example to the world in our protection of human dignity and equality for all. We pray for all who have been affected by the pandemic, for those who have died and those who have lost loved ones, for all who are suffering from illness and for all whose lives have been affected by isolation and disruption. We are grateful for the progress against the pandemic and the reopening that have been made possible in this country through the miracle of the vaccines. And we pray for greater availability of vaccines in the poor countries of the world where suffering remains great. Uh, we pray for President Biden and Vice President Harris and for all who exercise political and judicial authority in this country that they may fulfill their duties wisely and caringly. We pray for an end to gun violence in our country and we pray for the members of our armed forces and for all veterans. In the words often used by President Biden, may God protect our troops. We pray for the elimination of racism, which causes so much pain and suffering and also threatens our democracy. Racism is a threat to everyone. It must be overcome. It must be driven decisively from this country's culture and soul. 
We pray that people may be freed from poverty and oppression wherever they exist in the world, whether in other countries or here at home. And we ask protection and comfort for refugees and for all other immigrants. And we pray for our church. May this always remain a place where we can join together for prayer, warm fellowship, and works of charity and love. For all these things, God of love, we humbly and sincerely pray. And now let's join in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And now in these days when we have learned to value togetherness and, and the, build, the shared, sharing each other's presence, um, perhaps more than we appreciated in the past, let's join together in communion, the uh, symbol of togetherness. Uh, we give you thanks, God of majesty and mercy, for calling forth the creation and raising us from dust by the breath of your being. We bless you for the beauty and bounty of the earth and for the vision of the day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We rejoice that you call us to reconciliation with you and all people everywhere and that you remain faithful to your covenant even when we are faithless. We rejoice that you call the entire human family to this table of sacrifice and victory. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who leads us into truth, defends us in adversity, and gathers us from every people to unite us in one holy church. We remember that on the eve of death, Jesus gathered his disciples for the feast of Passover. Jesus took bread and after giving thanks to you, broke it and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We ask you, God, to send your Holy Spirit on this bread and cup and on us. Strengthen your universal church that it may be the champion of peace and justice in all the world. Restore the earth with your grace that is able to make all things new. May we remain faithful in love and hope in the eternal joy of your heavenly realm. Be present with us as we share this meal and throughout all our lives that we may know you as the Holy One who with Christ and the Holy Spirit lives with us forever. And now let us come to the table for all things are ready. Let us share in the bread of heaven and the cup of salvation. If you're still still struggling with these little with your little uh, uh, it's okay to eat it as we talk about as we share the Thanksgiving and go move on with our service. It's, it took me a while this morning, and it's one of those innovations of the pandemic that we will very quickly just let go. We we thank you, God for the gift of sharing bread and cup with our brothers and sisters in your presence. Although we join this communion today from many different places, we know that your spirit knows no boundaries and that it binds us together with each other and with you as fully as if we were sitting together in one room. May our communion meal sustain us 
as we seek to live our lives faithfully. And may we always be deeply aware of your presence and your love for us. Amen. And now's the time for announcements for the benefit of the church community. Yes, yes, Jim. Uh, I don't know how Zoom is working or who's there, but if it is working well, we've got to give a lot of thanks to the heroic efforts from Sharon and Steve Edwards because they've been on Verizon all week long oh. trying to get the internet working well. Well, that's great. Well, thank you. Thank you. We're all, we're all thankful for that. That, that was great. Uh, and any, any other announcements? Uh, I would like to remind everyone the memorial service for uh, Gail will be on Saturday, uh, July 17th at 2 p.m. And it will be uh, a hybrid service like today is where we can come to the sanctuary if we can and, and want to. And we can also take part by, uh, by Zoom. It's, 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 that's the best way to do it. Uh, and any other announcements? Okay. Well, now I'll... Um, uh, offer a brief benediction and then we will have uh, some more music. Uh, as we go back into the world, let us be thankful for God's constant and eternal care for each of us. May God bring greater love and unity to our beloved country. And may God bless us and keep us. May God shine the divine light upon us. And may God grant us and all in the world a full measure of God's peace. Amen. God bless America.